information. Again, terrible. Hmm. You once said that without it, quote, incompetent govern governance can be hidden under a cloak of secrecy. Well, of course. But we weren't in power yet. Look, is that your point, that because my position on certain things has changed over the years, that's a reason for you to have no beliefs at all? Coalition with separatists? Yes. Uh, great idea when I was pursuing it. Treason when they wanted to do it. Transparent government. You ran on that in 2006. As one does. Anything else? Quebec. No special status? status or is it a nation within Canada? Whichever works for you. Because these things, these inconsistencies, they're just situational. They have nothing to do with what I really believe. Do you believe in having integrity? Oh, I have a great deal of integrity. And I try to keep it as far away from this building as possible. Besides, integrity is the last thing Canadians want in their politicians. It's like the environment. Voters say they want it until you tell them how much it's going to cost. One more time. The things I say, the positions I take, the strategies I employ are all just a means to acquire power. Beliefs are what you serve once you have the power. And you better figure out what your beliefs are, because I'm going to give you a little power sometime soon, and you better know how you want to use it, or it will use you. You should go. Ben's got hockey. Yeah, I'll just... Um, Make a few awkward statements and then duck out. Oh, by the way, you don't happen to have a car you'd be willing to crash. No. Uh, too bad. We're about to make some changes to the Environmental Assessment Act. We're streamlining the process. That sounds good. Well, yes, but we're changing the act so that even if a project fails its environmental assessment, cabinet can still pass it, which is going to be funky. I was thinking you could maybe wreck your car the week back yet. I don't drive, sorry. Mm. Are you sleeping with anyone at the moment? For God's sake, don't tell me. That's not a bad idea. Maybe you could make out with them in a restaurant or something. Anyway, we got two weeks. Think on it. Oh, who's Ben playing again? Uh, Walt's Outdoor Products. Peggy Nash's son, Jonathan, is on that team. Uh, plays right wing. All right, good. I want to ask Peggy about her take on the Greek debt crisis. <laughs> oh, poor Peggy. He's going to ask the NDP finance critic about Greece. He'll talk to anyone about that stuff. Never show any interest in economics when he's around. No problem. I mean it. He started talking to me once about Hayek's concept for the denationalization of money as we boarded a plane in Belarus. The only reason he stopped was because the limo pulled in front of his house. When I got home, I realized I had pooped my shorts just a little. He literally bored the shit out of me. <laughs> you like him. I admire him more than any other politician I've ever met. Which is why it's going to be really hard to leave this job. Wait, are you leaving? Did he fire you? No, not yet, but it's just a matter of time. <laughs> Either I'll fuck something up, or he'll need me to take one for the team during some shitstorm. That's why there's so much turnover in this job. Being chief of staff is like being handed a grenade. It's going to go off at some point. So... Are you sleeping with anyone at the moment? parked in front of my aunt's house. My mom's in there. She's staying in there. I don't know why. Well, to get away from us. She's staying there to get away from us. She, uh... What are you doing? I'm telling you what I believe. So, I don't know how old I am. I, I'm small. I'm sitting in the car with my dad. He says, stay in here. He says, I'll be back in five minutes. He gets up. How am I supposed to know how long five minutes is? Would you like to sit down? So... I'm sitting there. Oh, I'm lying, sorry. I'm alone. I'm alone. I'm alone for too long. I get out, I'm knocking on the door, I'm ringing the bell. No one's coming. I can hear them in there, but nobody's coming. 
no, there's this neighbor lady behind me, and she's trying to figure out who I am, but I can't tell her because I'm crying. And I don't want to tell her because then I'd have to tell her that my father left me in the car, and my mother doesn't want me anymore, and... Sit down. What I believe in is myself. The only thing a person can or should rely on is herself. And you should never give up that power to anyone else. I agree. You do? Yes. Sit down. Sorry. No. It's embarrassing. Why? You didn't ask for my life story. You asked for what I believe. There's no difference. Would you like a drink? Huh? Mm. Hey, sweetie, are you still up? What are you doing? Best score tonight? Nice. Best word. You what? You tickle? You, you trickle. I don't even know what that word means. It's a little sack of fluid in your ear. It's a little sack of fluid in your ear. Keeps you oriented. Don't you stay on your feet. Speaking of which, did you take a bath? Jiggy, you were supposed to be in bed an hour ago. I know, I know. I, I know, I can't because I'm here. Just bathe and go to bed, okay? Or, you, you know what? I just found out that tomorrow is take your kid to work day around here. Mm hmm Yeah, you get to miss a day of school and come and hang out with me all day. I don't know what we'll do. We'll do something. Yes, I'm told there is a library here. No, we're, we're not doing that. No. no, there's a restaurant. We can go and eat the world's worst french fries. It'll be great. Well, yes, if he's around, you can eat him. Okay? Okay, now bathe and go to bed, mister. I love you. I expect I can arrange some time to see him. Oh, that's okay. He wants to meet John Baird. Really? Yeah, he says John Baird has a baby head on a grown-up body, and he's fascinated by it. Fair enough. So. You know, it's funny. I have a story like yours to a certain extent. My father's father was a respected man in Halifax, a school principal, a community leader. We all loved and admired him. And then one day, he just disappeared. They never found him. He never came back. After five years, he was declared legally dead, which was weird. I mean, obviously, but I learned something from that. I learned that your family is not inevitable. I learned the only thing inevitable is you. That realization it hurt at the time, but there's great strength in it. Each day I am for me. That doesn't exclude others. It makes others seem more real. It makes love possible. Because as soon as you recognize how truly alone we are, it makes the possibility of coming together more concrete. Did you want this? Sure, I'll have a drink. So, now that you have your principal, self-reliance, what are you going to do about it? No idea. I mean, we make laws here. Laws control people. The thing I apparently believe is the exact opposite of that. Mm. Strauss, Hayek, even Keynes, to some extent, wrestled with that huge question. Are those those weird guys from New Brunswick always eating together? <laughs> hey, philosopher and two economists. They were all interested in the role government played in personal freedom. Isn't government the opposite of personal freedom? No, actually, making humans more self-reliant is one of the things government does best. Have you had a hamburger lately? Yeah, at lunch. Fries were terrible. Mm. Did you die after you ate that hamburger? No. On behalf of your federal government, you're welcome. <laughs> People don't want to be left alone. They want a functioning society in which way things work the way they're supposed to, and hamburgers don't kill people. I spent a long time studying as an economist. I learned that money is the only thing standing between you and money using you. You know what money doesn't give a shit about? What? Anything. Left alone, money is the single biggest threat to your being self-reliant. And I say that as somebody who believes wholeheartedly in free markets. That realization led to the uh, creation of the welfare state. The intention was to free people to the greatest extent possible from the cold, indifferent grip of money. 
why do you sound like some sort of socialist right now? Because they got the problem right. The trick is, the trouble comes when you start to try to figure out how to fix the problem. For example, we say that freedom from hunger is a right in a rich society, which in itself is a great intention. But the attempt to address the problem legislatively leads to the creation of two groups, clients and administrators. And the creation of those two groups creates a problem as bad as the original one. Start with the administrators. The administrator's job is to get rid of hunger. But if he gets rid of hunger, his work is done and he's out of a job. So he has to constantly keep changing the definition of hunger. Changing the definition is known in bureaucratic circles by a different name, raising standards. Now, on the client side, the problem is... Is that people cheat the system, they abuse it. No, the number of people who abuse the system is statistically insignificant. No, the problem is that once a right has been achieved, it's taken for granted. You're a great example of this. A single mother who's had multiple state-sponsored abortions and is now a member of parliament. A couple of generations ago, that sentence would have seemed bizarre. But you wake up every morning and remark on the advances women have made in the last 50 years? Right. I spend most of my day trying to get you guys to stop staring at my tits when I'm making a point. Yes, so... Look at you, by the way. I... I'm saying you never get distracted by the girls. Um... I've never caught you looking at my breasts. Well, are, are they no good? It's a bit insulting, actually. I listen. I or are you too good for them? What? Too good for my breasts? No, I. I do, oh, listen. Oh, look at them. Well, just look at them. Well, no. Jeez, you're too good for my breasts. Come on, stop. Look. Yes. Nice. Okay. Okay. So, the point is, the client side is constantly taking every right for granted. The administrators are constantly raising standards. And politicians get elected by saying yes to the cycle of uh, assumed rights and rising standards. But if you say no to the cycle, you're accused of uh, lowering standards and taking away people's rights. So that's you. You're the guy who finally says no. You're the guy nobody wants to be. Well, that's my persona, yes, but my purpose... Look, I didn't get into politics because I looked around and I wanted to be a hatchet. I'm not a sadist. I'm here for the same reason you are, as it turns out. I want to defend, now, I want to revive the notion of self-reliance. I knew it. What? You and me. We're the same. Isn't it interesting how you can always tell when you're in the presence of somebody who's basically the same as you are? Even if he comes across as a motherfucking asshole. As I said, that's just my persona. I'm sorry. No, no. You know what? You're right. We are the same. Well, anyway, you solve one economics problem, you create half a dozen based in human nature. And human nature, as this, is much more complicated than economics. That's funny. You're still afraid of my first name. <laughs> One more. No, I'm sorry, I should have offered you another. Oh, that's okay. I'm self-reliant. Keep going. Leo Strauss, the guy I was talking about, said there are two kinds of nihilism. Do you know what that is? Nihilism, like, fuck all this shit? A, uh, yes, a prevailing absence of values leading to a sense that life is meaningless. Uh, fuck, all this shit is fucked. Yes. The first kind of nihilism... Uh, leads to fascism. The other kind, which Strauss says we have, is a sort of prevailing, permissive, egalitarian, everybody's ideas are equal kind of situation. The biggest problem with the client and the administrator? Both are Canadian. So the transaction is going to be polite. It's going to be non-judgmental. It's going to be, it's all right. However you got into this situation, however you became a client of the state, it's okay. I don't judge you. We are equal. What's wrong with that? It's not true. The exact opposite is true. In that moment, they are completely unequal. But because we're not able to be judgmental, we're not able to examine what might be wrong with the situation. Judgment is necessary. You think we should just wander around judging each other all the time? I think if we aren't allowed to have ideas competing, then we risk the nihilism Strauss talked about.
I think that you're just afraid of the mess. How do you mean? What if I have my ideas, but I don't want my ideas to compete with your ideas. I just want to have my ideas. What you don't like is the idea of everybody walking around thinking whatever they think, no matter how stupid what they think is. <laughs> what you don't like is the mess of that. I have no interest in controlling people's ideas. That's not what I said. What I said was, does the idea of everyone walking around thinking whatever they want, does that make you nervous? People, I admit, people are not my strong suit. No shit. You're the nerdiest prime minister in the history of Canada. <laughs> You're like a box of mashed potatoes in a suit. I feel I've come some way in that regard. <sighs> I read this thing once where somebody asks you if you love this country and you said something like, oh, what did you say? You said something like, well, you know, it's okay, you know, it'll, it'll do, you know? I know, I know. But who's ready for a question like that? It's okay. It'll do. Look, it was the start of the campaign. We had been working hard on the issues for weeks, and then this, this, this guy... <laughs> It's a little fat, a little fucking ugly, but it'll do. And a dozen things run through your mind, especially with the tricky questions. How is that a tricky question? But I'm never going to be the one to say the easy, stupid, moronic thing, you know? What, that you do in fact love this country you're trying to run? I didn't think of it in those terms. I didn't get into politics because of love. I got into it because I could see clearly that there was a job to be done. I could see clearly that I could do it, and nobody else qualified was around to do it. That's why I'm here. You basically said, I can make this place my bitch. <laughs> oh, God. I know, I know. Oh, no, I believe I said a number of things. And then I said, I gave up and said, it has a lot of potential. She's fuckable, but not dateable. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. <sighs> I could answer it now, though. Yeah? Yeah. Because before, when I was asked that stupid fucking moronic question, I haven't been up north yet. You ever been up there? I spent a month in Sudbury one weekend. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> it's big, actually big, but just empty. I just, I relax when I go north. And underneath it all, there's this richness. 25% of the world's oil and gas reserves buried, locked underneath, too expensive to extract. Ours, but not ours, you know? Mm -hmm. Social retard likes the isolation. <laughs> that is an acute observation. Oh, by the way, we're going to let your bill get to second reading. Okay. Which means uh, you're going to have to defend it at committee. Okay. There's still no chance of this passing, though, is there? Uh, no chance at all. Okay, good. Well, we better call uh, so it a night. So why are you doing all of this? Which? This. Why is a social retard putting himself through the endless bullshit of politics? Is there a goal, an end point? Oh, yes. You're not going to be one of those guys who just hangs on to power as long as possible? Nope. So what's the goal? The goal is simple. It's a number. It... Now, you know what? First, I'm going to tell you what the goals aren't. I'm going to tell you what I don't care about. Okay? You might need a drink for that. Yeah. Yeah, what the hell. Okay, first of all, I don't care about abortion. By which I mean, I don't care about it as an issue. I have personal feelings wrapped up in my faith, but I don't care about it as your prime minister. See the difference? I don't care about gay marriage or gun control, or building prisons, or the British monarchy. I have nothing against artists or the CBC. I don't care about hospital wait times. I don't care about the United Nations. Uh, and I don't care about regional alienation, a thing I am renowned for caring about. Uh, I don't care about the national long form census. I don't care whether drugs are criminalized or decriminalized. And I, oh God, I do not care about the motherfucking Senate. I don't care if they build a walkway from the shore to the airport in Toronto. I have nothing against David Suzuki. I um, don't care whether the world sees us as peacekeepers or bad asses. I don't care about Israel. I don't care what price our wheat sells for. I 
I don't care if our pipeline goes south to the States or all the way to China. I don't care if our new boats get built in Vancouver or Halifax. I don't care about Nickelback. <laughs> you know that great debate about whether uh, human rights tribunals uh, uh, create freedoms or inhibit them? Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care where the salmon went or why they came back. I don't care about multiculturalism. I don't care if you leave the country for 40 years and then come back and try to run it. I don't care how political parties are funded. I actually don't care about the price of gas. I don't care who is torturing who in Afghanistan or why. I don't care who the President of the United States is. And I do not care if your kid plays hockey or the accordion. I don't care. I'm so hot for you right now. <laughs> what I do care about is this. I want an appropriately sized government. A smaller government. No, that's the wrong way to look at it. The government can be any size it wants to be as long as it's appropriate for the size of the country it serves. Our government is just a little too big to be supported by the country. Just a little. So I want to restrict government growth by, by a few percentage points a year, and that's it. That's it. That's my whole thing. And I'm out of here. You said it's a number. That doesn't seem like much of a goal. Exactly. But you know what? It's like the country is a tiny kitten. And I keep saying I want to punch it in the face. The first thing I learned when I got into politics was that attempting to nudge the country just a little bit, just a little bit, towards being more self-reliant would make me into the devil himself. I don't believe we are in danger of descending into nihilism. I don't think we're in danger of being overwhelmed by the welfare state. I just think we could actually be happier if we moved away from those things just a tiny bit. And slowly, incrementally, under the cover of all the things people think I care about, that's what I'm doing. It's a number? Yeah. Sorry? You said it's a number. Yes, it's a number. That's the beauty. It's um, and once I hit that number and put in some controls to keep us on that number, that's it. I'm done. The debt-to-GDP ratio, the amount of federal debt relative to how rich we are as a nation. Depending on who you talk to, right now it's around 30%. I want to get it to 22%, keep it there. What about just eliminating the debt altogether? Debt can be very useful. We, live, we are part of a world of debt. When countries finance each other's debt, they remain interconnected in some very useful ways. But the amazing thing is, if you reduce that magical number from 30% to 22%, something incredible happens. What? We get happier. We get happier! And think about it. You, you tighten things up just a little bit, and all of a sudden you have to make a few more decisions. Fund this initiative, don't fund that one. Do this, don't do that. Debate becomes important. People become politically engaged, and when people live engaged lives about anything, their lives are more meaningful. And a life that is more meaningful is a happier life. Um, but, when I, what, sorry, what? But for some reason, when I tell people this, what they Well, I'm sorry, yeah, okay. But for some reason, when I tell people this, what they hear is...